Honorable ministers and state ministers, members of the diplomatic corps and heads of international organizations, invited guests, a very warm welcome to this beautiful amphitheater of the Ethiopian Science Museum. Today, the office of the prime minister hosts the very first edition of the Perspectives Occasional Public Lecture. In Amharic, we call this public lecture Qinyit. The occasional public lecture series aims to trigger conversation and debate on various development issues through the perspective and impressions of featured speakers. On the launch of this occasional public lecture series, we have the distinct honor of hosting the world-renowned economic professor, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who has been in Ethiopia for the past few days with his wife, Sonia Sachs. Please join me in welcoming the both of them with a warm applause. Today's lecture is entitled Financing Sustainable Development, Challenges and Prospectus in a Fragmented World. Over the past three years, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, interstate conflict and the related supply chain disruptions, the climate crisis as well as the debt crisis have threatened the growth of developing nations. The convergence of multiple crises are threatening sustainable development endeavors, which seem to have backtracked as an impact of these exogenous shocks. The lecture today by Professor Jeffrey Sachs will aim to shed light on enabling sustainable development in such a challenging global environment. Invited guests, in the past five years, Ethiopia has anchored its economic growth in the five key pillars of agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, mining, and ICTs. As we ruminate over financing sustainable development, it's inevitable that we explore Ethiopia's potential and prospects. Allow us to share a short video with you in this regard before we begin the lecture. Our potential is immense, our capabilities plenty, and our future is bright. 
At this juncture, I would like to invite Professor Jeffrey Sachs to take a seat on the stage, please. Allow me to share with you a little bit about our guest lecturer tonight. Professor Jeffrey D. Sachs is a world-renowned economist, best-selling author, innovative educator, and global leader in sustainable development. He is widely recognized for bold and effective strategies to address complex challenges, including the escape from extreme poverty, the global battle against human-induced climate change, international debt and financial crises, national economic reforms, and the control of pandemic and epidemic diseases. Professor Sachs serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, where he holds the rank of university professor, the university's highest academic rank. He was director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University from 2002 to 2016. He is president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, co-chair of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition, academician of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences at the Vatican, Commissioner of the United Nations Broadband Commission for Development, Tan Sri Jeffrey Chea Honorary Distinguished Professor at Sunway University, and Sustainable Development Goals Advocate for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. From 2011 to 2018, Professor Sachs has served as Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General's Kofi Annan, 2001 to 2007, Ban Ki-moon, 2008 to 2016, and Antonio Guterres, 2017 to 2018. Professor Sachs has authored and edited numerous books, including the three New York Times bestsellers, The End of Poverty, 2005, Commonwealth Economics for a Crowded Planet, in 2008, and The Price of Civilization, in 2011. Other books he authored include To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace, 2013, The Age of Sustainable Development, in 2015, Building the New American Economy, Smart, Fair, and Sustainable, 2017, A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism in 2018, The Ages of Globalization, Geography, Technology, and Institutions in 2020, and most recently, Ethics in Action for Sustainable Development, released in 2022. Professor Sachs is the 2022 recipient of the Tang Prize in Sustainable Development and was the co-recipient of the 2015 Blue Planet Prize, the leading global prize for environmental leadership. He was twice named among Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders. Professor Sachs has received 42 honorary doctorates and his recent award includes the Legion of Honor by decree of the President of the Republic of France and the Order of the Cross from the President of Estonia. Prior to joining Columbia University, Professor Sachs spent over 20 years as a professor at Harvard University, most recently as the Galen L. Stone Professor of International Trade. A native of Detroit, Michigan, Professor Sachs received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees at Harvard University. And I can already guess that one of his favorite countries where he might potentially retire is Ethiopia, as evidenced by the past few days' visit. Tonight, we are quite delighted to have Professor Jeffrey Sachs first share his impressions on Ethiopia from his short stay uh, over the past few days and deliver his lecture on financing sustainable development, challenges, and prospectus in a fragmented world. What an honor and pleasure to be with you, and thank you, Your Excellencies, uh, ambassadors and representatives of so many countries here that I've had a chance to say hello to, and Your Excellencies in the government of Ethiopia. It's a, a great privilege and a wonderful opportunity for us to discuss the situation in Ethiopia and the situation in Africa more generally. I want to leave one message, and that is that Africa's growth prospects for the next 40 years are extremely strong. Africa could achieve during the next 40-year period essentially what China achieved during the period from 1980 to 2020. China, as you know, achieved economic growth averaging around 10% per year economic growth. Phenomenal. When anything grows at 10% per period or per year, it means that it doubles in seven years. So China achieved that growth over 40 years. That means it was doubling essentially in economic size every seven years. 
And in a 40-year period, that is five doublings, 35 years plus. So if you double five times, that's two times two times two times two times two. That's a 32-time increase of output. China achieved about a 35-time increase of output from 1980 to 2020. And it went from a country of 1.4 billion people that was very poor in 1980 to either the second or the first largest economy in the world today, depending on how you measure things. If you measure the economy at what we call market prices, then China's number two. If you measure the economy at what we call international prices, so a common set of prices for each sector comparing the US and China, then China's the largest economy in the world. And China went from being a low-income country to a high-income country in a period of just over 40 years. My view is that this is possible for Africa and that this should be the aim. And it's actually quite convenient to speak about it now in 2023 because 40 years brings us to 2063, which of course is the birth of a unity of Africa, the Organization of African Unity, which in this great city, in this country, was founded in 1963. And all of Africa's aspirations are dated to the year 2063. I like that because it gives us a 40-year lead time. And development is a long-term process. It's not a short-term process. And if we take a 40-year lead time and consider Africa's starting point today, we should aim for nothing less than 8 to 10 percent per year compound economic growth over the next 40 years so that African poverty will be a thing of the past and Africa will be solidly a middle-income region of the world and many parts of Africa high income in the world by 2063. And I want to explain why that is feasible and as the title of the talk about finance suggests, why finance is so essential to achieving that objective. But the basic point is that economic development is a very high return activity if you do it right and if you're lucky to avoid wars and calamities. So you have to stay peaceful. This is critical. And if the neighbors are getting along with each other, this is critical. Because economic development depends on a peaceful region, in this case, a peaceful African continent, and an African continent that is in good relations with other parts of the world. That is for sure. But if that geopolitical environment can be achieved, and why not, then the economic side of the story is rather favorable. And the reason it's favorable is that if you do what I do for a living, which is Excel spreadsheets, basically, and ask what are reasonable scenarios based on economic modeling and economic history for the kind of growth that can be achieved, what you find is that the returns to economic development of a poor region are just about the highest returns on investment of anything in the world. I'd rather invest in Ethiopia's future than in some high-tech company because a high-tech company will not achieve compound interest returns of what Ethiopia can achieve of 15 to 20 percent, not rate of growth, but compound return on investment, which is a different concept. It's the financial return on the investments that are made. What's the real difference between the United States and Ethiopia in economic, return, in economic uh, basis? The real difference is that the United States, because of its history, many advantages and so forth, right now has a very high 
stock of assets for the people to benefit from. And the three main kinds of assets that the United States has are the education of the population, which averages right now about 15 years of average education, because in past history, people finished high school. And now, of course, 40% finish tertiary education. So it's about 16 years as of now, average years of education. A second gap is infrastructure. The physical infrastructure in the United States is robust and enormous. When I was a kid, I grew up in Detroit. Detroit was the motor city where all the automobiles were produced. So Detroit made sure politically that we build highways everywhere in the United States. And my youth was uh, uh, very much involved uh, in listening to building the interstate highway system between 1955 and 1975 in the United States. And that was thousands and thousands of miles of highway that linked a continent at full scale. Ethiopia doesn't have that, and Africa doesn't have that. Right now, the physical connectivity in Africa is very low. It's low in all regards. It's low in paved roads, it's low in highways, it's low in power grid, it's low in fiber. But none of that is fundamental that can't be overcome. All of it is actually, you know, in its way, rather straightforward investment. The technologies are known. NAPAD has produced the maps of where the grid should go, where the rail should go, where the power should go. So it's not a deep mystery, but that's the second big difference. And the third big difference, of course, is the business sector, the business investments. Business, why is business in, in the United States uh, so robust? Well, one reason is simply there's a very skilled workforce, and there is all the infrastructure that's needed wherever the goods are produced. You can ship them to a port. You can put them on rail. The freight system is very good, and the power is reliable, and so forth. And so returns to private investment are indeed very high. Now, if you add up the physical capital in the United States, that is the infrastructure and the business capital, it's about $210,000 per person. The investments that are needed to overcome the current liabilities, poor infrastructure, poor connectivity, not enough rail, and so forth, is not that expensive when you think about the returns that will come from that investment. And the other component, making sure that every child in Ethiopia has an education that reaches at least through 12 years, not just four years, but through 12 years, and that actually can go on for 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the young people to tertiary education. That's expensive, but not so expensive. And so when you do spreadsheets for a living and you ask what's the difference of a rich country and a poor country, the answer is investment and not even so much investment. A high flow of investment that if carried out over a period of 30 or 40 years brings you from poverty to high income status. So we say that China's development was a miracle but it wasn't a miracle. It was very good economic planning combined with good market forces, combined with a very strong focus on education over a period of 40 years. So China was able to fill in all the gaps. They built tens of thousands of kilometers of fast rail, tens of thousands of kilometers of highway, thousands of kilometers of power grid that connected China into a single power pool. They put all the kids in school. 
and the Chinese tiger mothers insisted, you will get at least 12 years of education, if not 16 years. You're our child, you're going to get educated. And so all of these pieces were put together, and the result is what I, as a development economist, love to see, which is this success during my career of this vast country of 1.4 billion people going from 70% extreme poverty to no extreme poverty during exactly the years of my professional life. Sonia and I went to China the first time in 1981. At the time, there were no private vehicles on the streets anywhere. There was poverty. There were lots of bicycles already, but there was poverty. And we went in 1981, and we've gone almost every year since then. And you could see the rise of a completely modern, cutting-edge economy in that period. So that's what I believe Africa should aim for and what Africa can achieve. Successful economic development at a high rate is based on investment in three categories. In human capital, especially education. Second, in infrastructure, roads, rail, power, fiber, water and sanitation, ports. And third, in business capital. My basic principle is if you get the first two right, the third will come. So the main focus of government is make a skilled population with solid knowledge, with entrepreneurial capacity, with understanding how to use cutting edge technology, give them the tools of ports, fast rail and all the rest, power and so forth. The business will come. Believe me, there's so many business opportunities in agriculture, in mining, in manufacturing, in tourism, in services, in finance. They're unlimited here. Everywhere you look, you can see business opportunities. But you need the infrastructure and the skilled work. So for me, that's what the government needs absolutely to focus on. For me, the single most important investment for Africa in the coming decade, bar none, is education. Get every child in school and enable them to stay in school through upper secondary. It's a heavy task. But don't let any child not have the chance to reach upper secondary completion. And this is not the current situation right now. My view is that if Africa ensures that by 10 years from now, every child has, is reaching upper secondary completion, you'll just see this economy take off because the farmers will be innovating. The business startups will be innovating. The service sector will develop. Tourism will soar. And that, to my mind, is the single highest return. In labor economics, we have a formula which predicts how much the wage goes up for each additional year of schooling. And the normal assumption is that one more year of schooling raises the income earned by 12%. If you look at the implication of that, the returns to schooling are, in a financial sense, are 22% return. That's the best return on the planet, is educating young people in real financial terms. I have done some simple calculations looking at how an economic growth model for Ethiopia might suggest the kinds of returns uh, that can be achieved. And there are two basic assumptions that one can look at. So one assumption is about financing. And I call it the high borrowing uh, scenarios where Ethiopia or an African
government has the chance to borrow high quality loans over a maturity of 40 years. Because borrowing short term for development is no good. You borrow for seven years on the euro bond market, you go broke in seven years because you don't get the benefits of development until 20 or 25 years. So the euro bond market's no good for this unless you're borrowing for 30 or 40 year loans. What you need is official finance for at least a 30 year maturity and a lot more of it. And so one part of the scenario is high versus low borrowing. The second assumption is whether the fertility rate remains quite high and goes down very gradually or whether the fertility rate comes down more rapidly through family planning and girls in secondary education and public awareness and so forth. So these are the two assumptions and I look at four scenarios where Ethiopia can't borrow externally and the fertility rate remains high. Second scenario where Ethiopia can borrow heavily at long term and the fertility rate remains high. Third scenario where Ethiopia can't borrow but the fertility rate goes down. And the fourth scenario where Ethiopia can borrow high and because of family planning or uh, universal schooling for girls as well as boys, the fertility rate reduces sharply. Well, suffice it to say that the difference of scenario one and scenario four is the bottom line is scenario one where there's a big borrowing constraint and where the fertility rate remains high. And the growth rate might be three or four percent per capita in such a scenario. Whereas the other scenario, the yellow line at the top, is the eight percent per year growth scenario. Now, what does it imply? It's the China uh, model, in a way. Uh, it's the fast growth based on a very high investment rate. What is being assumed here? The following. If the wonderful Minister of Finance of Ethiopia goes to the IMF right now, the IMF will tell, I don't know if there's anyone from the IMF here, but if they are, I want to speak with you. Um, because what you'll tell the finance minister is be extremely cautious, don't borrow, keep your debt low, gradually get out of the problems through domestic saving. My view is quite different. My view is borrow heavily, but 40 years, 40 years, not short term. Say, don't bother me for 30 years. I've got to get the kids through school. I've got to get them into the labor market. I've got to get the highways built, the rail built, the fiber built. I've got to do all of those things, so don't bother me for 30 years. Then I'll pay you back. If you do that, then this wonderful finance minister can afford to go to the education minister and say, give me a plan for universal completion of upper secondary within the next five years. And I want every child to have a tablet and I want them to have free data. I want them to be online. We're going to give them the best education. And we're going to go out and we're going to tell the business world worldwide, we're going to have the best educated labor force. You come and invest, you're going to reap huge returns. But they can't do that on the domestic budget. Because that cost of education, according to my calculations, are 12 to 15 percent of GDP. But you see, the minister is investing 4% of GDP, which is 20% of the government revenues. It's a huge effort. But Ethiopian budget can't support out of domestic revenues enough for universal secondary education. So the IMF says, don't worry about it. 
two-thirds of the kids won't complete high school, but at least you won't have a financial crisis. And I want to say to the IMF, wrong, completely wrong. Every child in Ethiopia is going to complete an upper secondary education, and you, the IMF, are going to go out with this fine finance minister to the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Belt and Road Initiative, to every financial source, to the European Union, to Turkey, to the Gulf, to get 40-year loans so that Ethiopia doesn't remain stuck with slow growth. Or better yet, it's not stuck with slow growth right now, but so that it can sustain a very high growth rate in the future. So that's my pet peeve argument with the IMF. And I'm in an argument with them right now that all their debt sustainability metrics are wrong. Because they tell poor countries don't borrow. But what they should tell poor countries is don't borrow short term. And I have one advantage over the IMF. They're all my students. I've trained them. And I say to them, you did not learn that in class. Who told you that the upper limit for borrowing is 30% of GDP gross debt? Are you kidding? What you learned in class is that if the net present value of investment is positive, take it. That's what you learned from me. And they say, oh, yes, Professor Sachs. So we're going to win this argument. It's only half the argument. We have to win the intellectual argument, but then we have to get the financing. And the financing is a little bit tricky because the image of Africa is it's very risky, and people don't understand that this is the highest return potential in the whole world. It is, literally for the ironic reason that there's more basic investment to do here than any other place. And the returns are astoundingly high. And when I say that to S&P 500 or to uh, Moody's or to Fitch, you know what they tell me? Professor Sachs, we're not development economists. And they say all our ratings are based on short-term indicators. We don't do the long term. We're just predicting whether there will be a financial crisis in the short term. But what they're looking at is liquidity crises, not the return to long term investment. And the return to long term investment is very, very high. So what are the key measures that are needed for continuing this high growth and even keeping even raising the growth rates in the future. The first is a surge of educational attainment. I want to see, really I want to see, within the next 10 years, every child understood you're going to complete upper secondary, grade 12 minimum. And if you pass exams at that point, you're going to higher education on the government's tab. Because this is the basis of all development. Nothing is more important than that. Second is health promotion, including family planning, including spacing and so forth, because education, uh, good labor market returns, and family planning will help reduce a very high fertility rate, which will be a big boost to economic growth. Third, of course, is promotion of key sectors agriculture, mining, manufacturing, tourism, culture, everything is here. This is a most magnificent and beautiful country. It's got everything. It's got nature, every ecosystem. It's got ancient history. It's got modern development. It's got tourism. You name it, it's here. And it's got history that goes back 3,000 years. It's incredible what you find in this country. So for tourism, it is unbelievable. Fourth is regional cooperation. You know, there's so many difficult regions in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel, but they're all trapped 
in poverty right now. They all need the boost to get out of the syndrome of poverty. They all need a lot more investment. And they need regional investment strategies that would connect Ethiopia with South Sudan, with Kenya, with Eritrea, with Somalia, with Somaliland, because you build a regional economy this way. And that will also reduce risks and help each of the neighboring countries also to develop a deeper strategy. And then each region and the AU as a whole needs to build out its partnerships with other regions. So Africa as a whole needs strong relations with the Gulf countries, for sure, with Turkey, with Russia, with China, with Japan, with Korea, with the United States, with the European Union. And all of this is possible right now. I'm a huge fan of the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. The Belt and Road Initiative is just wonderfully made for Africa's needs because it's about connectivity. It's about basic infrastructure. And so that's an example. The Gulf, I just came from Dubai, their sovereign wealth funds have trillions of dollars. They want food security. You are their food security. There's no limit to the investments they'll bring. So this is another part of the regional strategy that I think is so important. Of course, we need global cooperation. We need peace on this planet. That would be the first most important thing. I testified in the uh, UN Security Council a couple of weeks ago. I won't belabor the point, but my point was for all the wars we have right now, they could be stopped immediately because they're about politics. They're not about some intrinsic underlying urge for war, they're about politics. So politics can find political solutions. And diplomacy is absolutely the cheapest possible investment with the highest returns, even higher than education, because there's nothing more destructive than war. It's absolutely the worst single investment in the world. Not to mention the fact that the world spends two and a half trillion dollars a year on armaments and the United States alone 40% of that, which is absurd. Why does any country need to spend a trillion dollars on armaments in this world? All you do is build up armies that want to go fight someplace. And so it's absolutely ridiculous. So we do need peace to make this vision work. And the final point that I'll make is to reform the fiscal financial architecture, we're going to need some negotiation and diplomacy over the coming year. UN Secretary General Guterres is determined to put the global financial architecture at the center of international negotiations now. He's asked me, he asked me to help draft his SDG stimulus plan and I promote that plan around the world. One of my fervent hopes that I worked on for a number of years was to help the African Union to become the G21st country. As you know, now the AU has joined the G21. Don't ever call it the G20 again, please. It has African Union, it's now the G21. So we also have to get the message right. But the African Union has joined the G21, and that gives us the chance to negotiate, to negotiate a new global financial architecture, to negotiate a new debt sustainability framework of the IMF and the World Bank, to capitalize the regional institutions for example, the African Development Bank should be about 20 times larger than it is. Do you know the total lending of the African Development Bank is about $5 billion a year for 1.4 billion people? That's a little more than $3 per person in Africa. 
That's not good enough. We need the bank to be 20 times larger, and that requires a major capitalization of the African Development Bank, and that should be central to the international agenda. So let me just uh, end here by saying it's not only rhetoric, it is actually very deeply held, my deeply held view that these next 40 years will be Africa's years. This will be a period of tremendous development. Soon, and I think it is soon, within the coming decade, everyone will want to rush here because this will be the fastest growing part of the world economy. When they rush here, I want them to find that dynamic, skilled, young workforce that's ready with the ideas, the skills, the ability to implement advanced technologies. And if those pieces can be put together, this will be a glorious period in the period to 2063. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sachs. I would not do any justice if I tried to summarize uh, your lecture, but just um, to highlight some two or three items that stood out. Um, in your opening, you have testified that Africa's growth potential or prospects are extremely strong with development, um, recognizing that development is a long-term process and hence uh, the prospectus for Africa to be a middle-income uh, continent is uh, quite near. The second aspect that you emphasized that stood out is the key investments for development in three areas of human capital, infrastructure, and creating a conducive uh, business uh, environment and creating the business capital. I think um, I would uh, not be far-fetched in saying that Ethiopia is really has been focusing on these three key um, areas over the past five years. And I think in your summary of the key measures for Ethiopia's continued rapid growth, um, it was quite refreshing uh, to hear um, you expand on that because in a way it is a reaffirmation that uh, the country is on the right track, particularly with regards to the surge in education that you said. There has been a concerted effort over the past five years in terms of expanding education, the quality aspect of it focused on quality um, and also on preschool um, education, enhancing that the infrastructure is... Uh, exponentially increased uh, with a focus on that. A surge in health uh, promotion. Uh, we have had a very strong health sector and this has been further amplified as well over the past five years. Uh, the promotion of key sectors that you also highlighted, particularly in Ethiopia's homegrown economic reform um, agenda over the past five years is focusing on uh, manufacturing, agriculture, ICTs, tourism and mining. So we are on the right track. Regional cooperation that you mentioned, Ethiopia has created a ministry dedicated to uh, trade and regional cooperation for that. So again, we're on the right track in that. With global cooperation with Ethiopia being the newest member, particularly as we enter in 2024 to be part of the BRICS. Again, that is a huge opportunity, but it's also reaffirmation in that regard. And then finally, with regards to uh, the financial framework, this is a much more global um, uh, call. But uh, just to recall that uh, in the new financing Impact um, Summit in France, the Prime Minister had been uh, very keen and uh, uh, emphasized the call for uh, a renewal of the global financial architecture to be able to uh, support sustainable development. So thank you very much again, uh, Professor Sachs. Thank you.